Hello, and welcome to Booked on Shalom World TV. I'm your host, Claire Hinshaw. Today we have with us Tom Corcoran, the co-author of Seriously God. Tom received his bachelor's degree from Loyola University, Maryland, and completed his graduate work in theology with Franciscan University of Steubenville. Tom has served Church of the Nativity in Maryland in a variety of roles that have given him a unique perspective on parish ministry and leadership. Beginning as a youth minister, Tom later held positions as coordinator of children's ministry and director of small groups. He currently serves in the position of associate to the pastor and is responsible for weekend message development, strategic planning, and staff development. When he isn't working, Tom enjoys spending time with his wife, Mia, and their seven children. Tom, welcome to Booked. It's great to have you with us. Thank you. It's good to be with you, Claire. Well, I'd like to start out with kind of doing a little bit of an overview of the book. You write this book in six chapters, and each of those deals with what I would say is kind of a frustration that people can develop with God. Things like, why is a bad person in a position of power? Or why does God seem to be answering my questions with a no? And I'm sure there are many other topics, many other frustrations you could have included in the book, but I would love to know how you focused in on the six that you did and why you thought those were the most important to address. Right. So th those come out of a couple of different things. One, I work in a parish with my pastor, Father Michael. So these are some of the issues that we deal with or come up again in conversations with uh, parishioners and members of our church who are wrestling with God or seeking God. So some out of our conversations, uh, some because we we preach in a message series at the church. We take a topic and over a series of weeks, look at it. And these kind of came up in the lectionary as we were doing a, a series on this at our church. So somewhat just the Bible or scripture, or I guess you could say the Holy Spirit led us to these topics that seem to be ones that uh, are uh, present in the scripture, because really all the arguments against God are already in the scripture. How great is God that he already deals those arguments for us? And so our frustrations with God, God acknowledges them. So we found them in the scripture and through conversations we have with parishioners here at Church of Nativity in Timonium. Well, it's interesting, you know, I was actually planning to ask you this question a little later, but you kind of got to it ahead of me, is this uh, idea that it was all in the scriptures. And that was something I noticed as I was reading the book was that in every chapter, you include at least one, but I think usually two stories from scripture that really um, focus in on biblical characters struggling with these issues and how they dealt with them. So you talked about this a little already, but maybe you could elaborate on how you picked those particular scripture stories, because I'm sure there were many you could have chosen from, but how did you decide which ones were the best to use? That's right. There definitely is a, a bunch of different stories we could use. And what we did in the book is we took a, the, a major issue, like you, some of those you've already talked about, the you know pain or death or when God says no to us in our prayers. And then we did an Old Testament story and a New Testament story. And somewhat they were linked. So uh, one is when God, you know, when God allows storms in our life. So the Old Testament is Jonah and the New Testament is uh, Mark and Jesus' coming of the sea. And so they'll kind of have a theme to them right there. So some were themes, some were stories that just speak to us. One on the problem of pain and suffering is, comes out of Acts and the Apostle Paul and, and his life. And that's, there's a verse in there. I'll let you find the verse, but just I think speaks so well to the problem of pain. And we, we wanted to share that, that kind of conclusion that Paul comes to after an incredible story. Uh, some, again, came in lectionary as we were teaching to our church. So a, a kind of mix of what speaks to our hearts and just what comes about through our teaching and preaching here at our parish. It's interesting you say that you did try to use both an Old Testament and a New Testament story. That was something I was already about halfway through the book. And in one of the chapters, I thought, oh, this is interesting. I'm seeing the old and the new. Did they do that in all of the chapters? But I thought that was a really nice touch, bringing 
the old and the new testament, the old and the new covenant together in that way, and and seeing how they they do the the new fulfills the old. Um, they really do complement each other in that way. But one other thing that I thought was interesting in the book was how you began each chapter. You used two quotes at the beginning of each chapter, a secular quote and a spiritual, often scriptural quote. Uh, we've already mentioned the chapter on pain a couple times, and that was one that really made me smile because you used that famous quote from The Princess Bride that life is pain and anyone who says differently is selling something. But then you also used a reflection from C.S. Lewis, who wrote a whole book on the problem of pain. So I thought that was a really interesting way to introduce each of the chapters. And I would love to know what the thinking was behind introducing them that way and how you chose those quotes. Well, we wrote the book to be, uh, it's not a, a comprehensive study on all these issues, of course. I think take a much larger book. It's meant to be very readable and accessible, and especially for the person that's unchurched or dechurched or walked away from church. It's meant to be a book that if you're a, a believer, you can hand on to somebody who struggles with faith. And so partly it's just meant to be a nod to that, you know, pick something from the Princess Bride or a movie um, from secular culture. That's a nod to people who are are familiar with that, like Princess Bride who doesn't love that movie. So um, it's meant to, again, be that nod to it. Does You don't have to be a church person or religious person to read this book to seek God. Uh, and so we're, we are picking something from from culture that people might be familiar with that might stick with people. And then, of course, yeah, the, a scripture verse or something from someone, C.S. Lewis, another theologian or spiritual writer to, OK, then draw us in and kind of frame the chapter. But it, it does definitely speak to our desire to reach people who can might have walked away from the church or feel like they all these some of these issues must have drove a wedge between them and, and faith in God. Oh, that makes sense. And I think for me reading it, I, it was a good way to kind of draw you into the chapter and in an, in an easy way. It's easier to start reading something when you see just a little quote at the beginning rather than a huge paragraph. The paragraphs then seem a little less daunting once you've gotten through those first two sentences. <laughs> but um, something else you were saying that uh, really, as we were talking about this, reminded me is um, at the end of each chapter, you include a couple reflection questions. And that really said to me that you want your reader not to just read the book, but to really engage with it and go deeper. So I was wondering if you could share how you think a reader can best engage with the book, how they can incorporate it into their lives, and how you think it might be able to impact their lives. Right. When you write a book, you want people to, to engage in it. You hope it is transformational and life-changing, and hopefully it's life-changing by being, bringing people to closer to Christ or starting a relationship with Christ. So uh, the idea, though, is people can engage in whatever level they want. So if you want to read the chapter, read the chapter, and that's okay. But then these questions could be the three questions at the end of each chapter can be for you to journal about. Or uh, we actually created small group resources. So for people to get together in small face-sharing communities and to uh, – we, we even put a kit together that uh, parishes could get people together or just anybody could get people together. And we even have videos and things like that that people can watch that go along with the book. There is something better about conversation. When we talk about something with others, conversation uh, and conversion actually have the same etymology. They share that same root. And so we hope people take the book wherever it is. If there's even one nugget that they take away that helps them say, okay, I, something about God it, uh, that I didn't understand before or now makes a little bit more sense to me and I can, or I do have a, con I do journal about it or I start to have some conversations with other people and all those things <laughs> taken together will bring a greater life change, but any one of them can really change our minds and our hearts. Oh, I love that because I actually, this is something that struck me recently as I've been in a small group um, prayer, not exactly a Bible study, but similar to that. And it struck me how I get so much from the conversation, but then I also get so much when I engage with it on my own outside of the group. And so I love that you, as you just said, you can kind of do both with the reflection questions. You can do both with the book and you can get so much out of it when you do both of those together. 
But as we come to the end here, I would love to just dig a little bit deeper into one of the chapters. And it's one that you've mentioned a couple of times. I've mentioned a couple of times. So you may have picked up that this was one that really jumped out at me. And that was that chapter on the problem of pain. And I thought this was such an important chapter because it is such a universal human experience. You don't get out of this life without some pain in it. So I would love if you could just share a little bit about the conclusions that you come to in that chapter on how to approach pain and suffering as a Christian. Yeah, the, that chapter, like all the chapters, again, gives some insight to these issues. So it can't, it's not a comprehensive look, but what I think is in each story. So one story is the story of Joseph uh, in the Old Testament, who's betrayed by his brothers, uh, thrown into prison unjustly. I mean, um, so who goes through an incredible amount of suffering, pain, betrayal. And the other story, as I mentioned earlier, is the story of Paul, who who knew pain. He was beaten up and, and scourged, and and he had and shipwrecked, and all kinds of pain. And I think what you can learn from these two stories is again, they're, they're slivers of insight. They're they're not going to answer all those questions, but they give us some slivers of insight. And I, I don't know. I kind of want to tell you, and I kind of want you to read the book. <laughs> want people <laughs> to read the book to see what they were. But I mean, you get to the end of the Joseph story, and he comes to this incredible insight about the pain and he forgives his brothers and he sees God at work. So if you don't know the story of Joseph, you should go read the first book of the Bible and then go read our chapter. And the same thing about Paul. And he comes to an incredible insight about his pain after being uh, nearly stoned to death and beaten. And, and again, he nearly dies. And yet he comes with these incredibly encouraging words about pain. And, and Paul is an incredible person for us to study on that. So as I think as you read the book on that, I want you to discover that for yourself, but that is the thing. That's the great thing about reading scripture. There's one day, especially the, the thing on Paul, I, I was reading this and this verse jumped out of me from Acts that's in the book. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's an incredible insight. And I think that is the thing. We have to, we have to kind of discover them for ourselves. Let's be honest. God often doesn't make sense. If you're not a religious person, this may be precisely why you don't go to church, believe the Bible, or even accept the reality of God. There are too many commandments that seem inconsistent, too much church history that's indefensible, way too much going on in the world to reconcile with an all-loving God. Even if you are a follower of Jesus, it can be difficult to understand. If you find yourself struggling at times with the question of God, congratulations, you are in good company. The heroes of the Bible frequently experienced situations in which they misunderstood or completely failed to understand God. Abraham couldn't comprehend why God gave him a son and then asked him to give up his son. It didn't make any sense. Moses, with a speech impediment and extreme shyness, was the least likely person ever to serve as God's chosen, chosen to lead Israel out of the slavery of Egypt. It didn't make any sense. David, a mere boy, was blindsided when God anointed him king. It didn't make any sense. The apostles, the closest friends and followers of Jesus, were constantly confused by his teaching and preaching. It didn't make any sense. While God not making sense is nothing new, we offer you three important principles to keep in mind as you read this book. First principle, it makes sense that God doesn't always make sense. To put it bluntly, if those of us who believe in the God of the Bible have it right, then God is smarter and older than we are and thinks in ways far beyond our capacity. God is smarter than we are. The universe is unfathomably vast in its design, but also, also incredibly intricate in its detail. The skill, for lack of a better word, needed to create the universe is unimaginable. As scientists study its exquisite, astonishing composition and complexity, the genius of creation is more and more revealed. And despite advances in these studies, scientists still do not even know what holds matter together. Everything that is argues for an intelligent force behind creation. We call this force God. And while his wisdom, knowledge, and understanding are complete and comprehensive, ours is not. God thinks differently than we do. At one point in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus rebukes his friend Peter, telling him, you are thinking not as God thinks, but as human beings do. 
Matthew 16, 23. Peter's problem is our problem. We think as human beings think. And you might wonder, well, how else am I supposed to think? However, God doesn't actually want us to think only from a human perspective, but to somehow try to see life from his perspective. St. Paul called this the renewal of our minds. Paul's letter to the Romans reminds us that there is false thinking in every age. Each generation holds and forms errors in thinking. Therefore, we must become aware of conforming our thinking to the common wisdom of our age and instead learn to think as God thinks. Well, I grew up in Philadelphia, and so, which is the, the home of the Constitution and the birthplace of the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. So I think early on, uh, especially the words the Declaration of Independence, that um, we've been given certain unalienable rights by our creator, that those words always resonate with power that our country, uh, the United States, was born out of that. So I think that just studying the American Revolution as an elementary school kid was a, a time I learned about the power of words. Our books come out of our uh, message series that we do here at our church uh, outside of Baltimore in Timonium. So uh, probably for every um, message series, you probably study 20, 25 hours uh, just in um, you know, research and that. So it, it comes out of really just having to speak to the people of our community. And when something of that comes out that's worth saying that to a larger a larger community, then we, we do even a little bit more research. So um, it, it comes from really speaking to the people of our parish. This is a great question because books have really changed me over my life. Now, they're not all Catholic. And um, some, some of the books that have, have really influenced me are, are Wild at Heart, which is not a Catholic book. Uh, I've been very influenced by C.S. Lewis. Again, he's not a Catholic author. Problem of Pain has been a huge book, but Mere Christianity. Uh, Peter Kreef, um would be probably the biggest Catholic book. Uh, and he wrote a book, uh, it was Between Heaven and Hell. It's a little, it's a trialogue between Aldous Huxley, C.S. Lewis, and John F. Kennedy, who all died on the same day. Uh, that book had a huge, profound impact on me in just wrestling to the ground who the person of Jesus Christ is. When we read a story, we're not just passive, we're actually active. Uh, brain studies have found that when a story is being read or, or told to us, or reading it on our own, we are actively engaged. Our minds are wondering, how would I act in that situation? And when it comes to the biblical stories, uh, they are showing us the kind of relationship that God wants to have with us. So these are not just stories about, oh, this is what something, a relationship God had with someone 2,000 or 2,500 years ago, but it's not available to you. They show us, no, they show us the way uh, and the type of relationship that God wants to have with us. You write a book for other people, but you always so write it for yourself. And I think in this book, Seriously, God, uh, there was one chapter that came over and over again to really speak to me that challenged me. And it's a, a chapter on grumbling and complaining. And through the book process, you, you write it, then you have to reread it and rewrite it. Then you get it back from the the uh, publisher and you have to rewrite, you know, reread it again. And then I was an audio book. I had to record it. And Every time the chapter on grumbling and complaining hit me between the eyes that, oh my gosh, I grumble and complain too much. So uh, that, that surprised me. I would not have thought of myself as that being an issue until I wrote the book and realized every time I've reread that chapter, I have to deal with that, that issue. Well, Tom, thank you so much for being with us. We enjoyed having you on. Thanks for having me, Claire. I've really enjoyed the book, Seriously God, by Father Michael White and Tom Corcoran. Uh, this is a book that has spoken to me so deeply that it's now become a point of reference in my life, and it's become knit into the fiber of, of who I really am. And I believe that's because of, because of the fact that it addresses some of life's most difficult questions that we all are left trying to answer at times, questions about injustice, about pain, suffering, um, poor leadership that we face times in life. And so many of us have these questions. 
And the authors do a really nice job of using stories. And in fact, in the book, they say that our stories are undeniable. They're a way that we're taught the truth of the word of God. So they share stories from the Bible about Jonah and his journey, uh, about Joseph and the tremendous oppression that he faced. But then they take it one step further and share personal stories, personal stories about times when the church was facing large decisions and headed in a, dire in a direction and everything fell out from underneath it. And they were wondering, God, what could you possibly be doing? Uh, times when Father White looks back and he's very candid about things he wishes he had done differently as a leader. And then there are these deeply difficult, heart-wrenching stories about people that were lost in, in, uh, in the church. A young person that was taken before their time and uh, a beautiful worship leader that suffered from chronic illness. And you feel this pain as you're hearing these stories. And it's so relatable. So many of us have had pain like this in our life. And if you haven't yet, you probably will at some point. And you'll be left wondering, God, where are you leading me with this? Why is this happening? And, and where do I find you in this? And unfortunately, so many times, if we, if we don't get to know what God can do in this situation, we hear the canned Christian response of, well, it just must be God's will. But I don't believe that's the case in all situations. And when we give that answer, I think sometimes we can be doing more harm than we are doing good. And this book allows us to see God's hand through times like this. And it allows us to change our perspective to one of a human earthly perspective to that of an eternal perspective, God's perspective. And the world needs this message. The world needs this hope. I know I do as a, as a believer. And we have this tool in this book to now share this hope. I don't think it's any coincidence that this book is available at this point in history. We've come through COVID, um, people are feeling anxious, they've experienced loss, anxiety, they're fearful. And now we have this opportunity to share the truth of the word of God through this message. Um, the last chapter was tremendously impactful for me. It's a book, uh, this chapter deals with death and as a result, heaven. And I've graduated from Bible college. I've led a small group for years. Uh, this is a topic that I, I felt like I knew. I felt like I've studied about heaven and revelation. But this is a, just a whole new level. And it was a, a landmark in my faith to learn more about heaven and experience a new, beautiful expectation for what heaven will be like. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. I know that other people will as well. So I encourage you to read it or listen to it on Audible. Thank you for joining us for Booked on Shalom World TV. We'll see you next week with a new episode. Until then, happy reading. Problems, worries, sadness, are you seeking solutions? Bible says, do not be anxious about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Choose faith over fear.